Today, we're going to finish reading Two Kinds from the Joy Luck Club by Amy Tan. We are starting our reading today on page 20. Remember last week in Amy Tan's excerpt, Two Kinds, we read about how nine-year-old Jing Mei faces pressure to be great from her immigrant mother. Mrs. Wu watches child geniuses perform things that make them famous. She wants Jing Mei to become famous too. At first, Jing Mei shares her mother's hopes, but soon she realizes that she may never be the talented child of her mother's dreams. She begins to resent her mother's efforts. However, when Mrs. Wu watches a Chinese child pianist on television, she thinks that she has found the perfect activity for Jing Mei. As the story continues today, we will read about how Jing Mei and her mother must both learn to understand each other's point of view. Let's pick up right here on page 20. And her fingers felt like a dead person's, like an old peach I once found in the back of the refrigerator. The skin just slid off the meat when I picked it up. I soon found out why old Chong had retired from teaching piano. He was deaf. Like Beethoven, he shouted to me. We're both listening only in our head. And he would start to conduct his frantic silent sonatas. Our lessons went like this. He would open the book and point to different things, explaining their purpose. Key, treble, bass, no sharps or flats. So this is C major. Listen now and play after me. And then he would play the C scale a few times, a simple chord. And then, as if inspired by an old, unreachable itch, he gradually added more notes and running trills and a pounding bass until the music was really something quite grand. I would play after him the simple scale the simple chord, and then I just played some nonsense that sounded like a cat running up and down on top of garbage cans. Old Chong smiled and applauded and then said, very good, but now you must learn to keep time. So that's how I discovered that Old Chong's eyes were too slow to keep up with the wrong notes I was playing. He went through the motions in halftime. To help me keep rhythm, he stood behind me, pushing down on my right shoulder for every beat. He balanced pennies on top of my wrists so I would keep them still as I slowly played scales and arpeggios. He had me curve my hand around an apple and keep that shape when playing chords. He marched stiffly to show me how to make each finger dance up and down, staccato, like an obedient little soldier. He taught me all these things, and that was how I also learned I could be lazy and get away with mistakes, lots of mistakes. If I hit the wrong notes because I hadn't practiced enough, I never corrected myself. I just kept playing in rhythm, and old Chong kept conducting his own private reverie. So maybe I never really gave myself a fair chance. I did pick up the basics pretty quickly, and I might have become a good pianist at that young age. But I was so determined not to try, not to be anybody different, that I learned to play only the most ear-splitting preludes, the most discordant hymns. Over the next year, I practiced like this, dutifully in my own way. And then one day, I heard my mother and her friend, Lindo Zhang, both talking in a loud, bragging tone of voice so others could hear. It was after church, and I was leaning against the brick wall, wearing a dress with stiff white petticoats. Auntie Lindo's daughter, Waverly, who was about my age, was standing farther down the wall, about five feet away. We had grown up together and shared all the closeness of two sisters squabbling over crayons and dolls. In other words, for the most part, we hated each other. I thought she was snotty. Waverly Zhang had gained a certain amount of fame as Chinatown's littlest Chinese chess champion. She'd bring home too many trophy, lamented Auntie Lindo that Sunday. All day she played chess. All day I have no time to do nothing but dust off her winnings. She threw a scolding look at Waverly, who pretended not to see her. You lucky you don't have this problem said Auntie Linda with a sigh to my mother. And my mother squared her shoulders and bragged, Our problem worser than yours. If we ask Jing Mei wash dish, she had nothing but music. It's like you can't stop this natural talent. Right then, I was determined to put a stop to her foolish pride. So let's pause right here, guys. Remember that good readers make inferences. So in addition to what you already know about life, you know a lot about the characters and the story events. So as you read this story and you get new details, you want to connect them to what you already know to make more inferences. 
Take a look here where the narrator practices and think about why she does that. Now she practices at Old Chong's because her family does not have a piano. I know that she gets away with lots of mistakes and only learns to play ear splitting and discordant songs. So you can underline or highlight that detail in paragraph 47 about the mother, where she squared her shoulders and bragged. Now, based on these details, I don't think the narrator's mother has ever heard her play. She's bragging about it, what a great pianist her daughter is, but really we know her daughter's just been faking it this whole time. A few weeks later, Old Chong and my mother conspired to have me play in a talent show, which would be held in the church hall. By then, my parents had saved up enough to buy me a second-hand piano, a black Wurlitzer spinet with a scarred bench. It was the showpiece of our living room. For the talent show, I was to play a piece called Pleading Child from Schumann's Scenes from Childhood. It was a simple, moody piece that sounded more difficult than it was. I was supposed to memorize the whole thing, playing the repeat parts twice to make the piece sound longer. But I dawdled over it, playing a few bars and then cheating, looking up to see what notes followed. I never really listened to what I was playing. I daydreamed about being somewhere else, about being someone else. The part I liked to practice best was the fancy curtsy. Right foot out, touch the rose on the carpet with a pointed foot, sweep to the side, left leg bends, look up and smile. My parents invited all the couples from the Joy Luck Club to witness my debut. Auntie Lindo and Uncle Tin were there. Waverly and her two older brothers had also come. The first two rows were filled with children, both younger and older than I was. The littlest ones got to go first. They recited simple nursery rhymes, squawked out tunes on miniature violins, twirled hula hoops, pranced in pink ballet tutus, and when they bowed or curtsied, the audience would sigh in unison, Aww, and then clap enthusiastically. When my turn came, I was very confident. I remember my childish excitement. It was as if I knew without a doubt that the prodigy side of me really did exist. I had no fear whatsoever, no nervousness. I remember thinking to myself, this is it, this is it. I looked out over the audience at my mother's blank face, my father's yawn, Auntie Lindo's stiff-lipped smile. Waverly's sulky expression. I had on a white dress layered with sheets of lace and a pink bow in my Peter Pan haircut. As I sat down, I envisioned people jumping to their feet and Ed Sullivan rushing up to introduce me to everyone on TV. And I started to play. It was so beautiful. I was so caught up in how lovely I looked that at first I didn't worry how I would sound. So it was a surprise to me when I hit the first wrong note and I realized something didn't sound quite right. And then I hit another, and another followed that. A chill started at the top of my head and began to trickle down. Yet I couldn't stop playing, as though my hands were bewitched. I kept thinking my fingers would adjust themselves back, like a train switching to the right track. I played this strange jumble through two repeats, the sour notes staying with me all the way to the end. All right, let's pause right here. Let's take a look at paragraph 54. So in this paragraph, the author uses positive descriptions to highlight the narrator's excitement about the recital as it begins. But she also uses negative descriptions to indicate when and why the narrator's feelings change. The descriptions relate to a change that occurs over the course of the recital. As the recital begins, the narrator is captivated by the moment and she feels positive. But then things change as her performance falters. And by the end, she's aware of her failure. The author shows the change by using those descriptive words at key points. Now, as you read paragraph 54, I want you to mark the descriptive words and take note of what these words describe. I'm looking at words like beautiful, lovely, chill, when it starts to change when she hits the wrong note, bewitched, 
the strange jumble. So those words, you can really feel where it shifts from very positive tone to a negative tone. Let's go ahead and go on to the next part. When I stood up, I discovered my legs were shaking. Maybe I had just been nervous, and the audience, like old Chong, had seen me go through the right motions and had not heard anything wrong at all. I swept my right foot out, went down on my knee, looked up and smiled. The room was quiet, except for old Chong, who was beaming and shouting, Bravo, bravo, well done. But then I saw my mother's face, her stricken face. The audience clapped weakly. And as I walked back to my chair with my whole face quivering as I tried not to cry, I heard a little boy whisper loudly to his mother, that was awful. And the mother whispered back, well, she certainly tried. And now I realized how many people were in the audience, the whole world it seemed. I was aware of eyes burning into my back. I felt the shame of my mother and father as they sat stiffly throughout the rest of the show. We could have escaped during intermission. Pride and some strange sense of honor must have anchored my parents to their chairs. And so we watched it all. The 18-year-old boy with a fake mustache who did a magic show and juggled flaming hoops while riding a unicycle. The breasted girl with white makeup who sang for Madama Butterfly and got honorable mention. And the 11-year-old boy who won first prize playing a tricky violin song that sounded like a busy bee. After the show, the Sus, the Jongs, and the St. Clairs from the Joy Luck Club came up to my mother and father. Lots of talented kids, Auntie Lindo said vaguely, smiling broadly. That was something else, said my father, and I wondered if he was referring to me in a humorous way or whether he even remembered what I had done. Waverly looked at me and shrugged her shoulders. You aren't a genius like me, she said matter-of-factly. If I hadn't felt so bad, I would have pulled her braids and punched her stump. But my mother's expression was what devastated me. A quiet, blank look that said she had lost everything. I felt the same way, and it seemed as if everybody were now coming up, like, like gawkers at the scene of an accident, to see what parts were actually missing. When we got on the bus to go home, my father was humming the busy bee tune, and my mother was silent. I kept thinking she wanted to wait until we got home before shouting at me. But when my father unlocked the door to our apartment, my mother walked in and then went to the back into the bedroom. No accusations, no blame. And in a way, I felt disappointed. I had been waiting for her to start shouting so I could shout back and cry and blame her for all my misery. I assumed my talent show fiasco meant I never had to play the piano again. But two days later, after school, my mother came out of the kitchen and saw me watching TV. Four o'clock, she reminded me as if it were any other day. I was stunned, as though she were asking me to go through the talent show torture again. I wedged myself more tightly in front of the TV. Turn off TV, she called from the kitchen five minutes later. I didn't budge. And then I decided. I didn't have to do what my mother said anymore. I wasn't her slave. This wasn't China. I had listened to her before, and look what happened. She was the stupid one. She came out from the kitchen and stood in the arched entryway of the living room. Four o'clock, she said once again, louder. I'm not going to play anymore, I said nonchalantly. Why should I? I'm not a genius. She walked over and stood in front of the TV. I saw her chest was heaving up and down in an angry way. No, I said, and I now felt stronger, as if my true self had finally emerged. So this was what had been inside me all along. No, I won't, I screamed. She yanked me by the arm, pulled me off the floor, snapped off the TV. She was frighteningly strong, half pulling, half carrying me toward the piano as I kicked the throw rugs under my feet. She lifted me up and onto the hard bench. I was sobbing by now, looking at her bitterly. Her chest was heaving even more, and her mouth was open smiling crazily as if she were pleased I was crying. You want me to be someone that I'm not, I sobbed. I'll never be the kind of daughter you want me to be. Only two kinds of daughters, she shouted in Chinese. Those who are obedient and those who follow their own mind. Only one kind of daughter can live in this house, obedient daughter. 
Then I wish I wasn't your daughter. I wish you weren't my mother, I shouted. As I said these things, I got scared. It felt like worms and toads and slimy things crawling out of my chest. But it also felt good, as if this awful side of me had surfaced at last. Too late, change this, said my mother shrilly. And I could sense her anger rising to its breaking point. I wanted to see it spill over. And that's when I remembered the babies she had lost in China, the ones we never talked about. Then I wish I'd never been born, I shouted. I wish I were dead, like them. It was as if I had said the magic words, Alakazam, and her face went blank, her mouth closed, her arms went slack, and she backed out of the room, stunned, as if she were blowing away like a small brown leaf, thin, brittle, lifeless. It was not the only disappointment my mother felt in me. In the years that followed, I failed her so many times each time asserting my own will, my right to fall short of expectations. I didn't get straight A's. I didn't become class president. I didn't get into Stanford. I dropped out of college. For unlike my mother, I did not believe I could be anything I wanted to be. I could only be me. And for all those years, we never talked about the disaster at the recital or my terrible accusations afterward at the piano bench. All that remained unchecked like a betrayal that was now unspeakable. So I never found a way to ask her why she had hoped for something so large that failure was inevitable. And even worse, I never asked her what frightened me the most. Why had she given up hope? For after our struggle at the piano, she never mentioned my playing again. The lesson stopped. The lid to the piano was closed, shutting out the dust, my misery, and her dreams. So she surprised me. A few years ago, she offered to give me the piano for my 30th birthday. I had not played in all those years. I saw the offer as a sign of forgiveness, a tremendous burden removed. Are you sure? I asked shyly. I mean, won't you and Dad miss it? No, this your piano, she said firmly. Always your piano. You only one can play. Well, I probably can't play anymore, I said. It's been years. You pick up fast, said my mother, as if she knew this was certain. You have natural talent. You could be genius if you want to. No, I couldn't. You just not trying, said my mother. And she was neither angry nor sad. She said it as if to announce a fact that could never be disproved. Take it, she said. But I didn't at first. It was enough that she had offered it to me. And after that, every time I saw it in my parents' living room, standing in front of the bay windows, it made me feel proud, as if it were a shiny trophy I had won back. Last week, I sent a tuner over to my parents' apartment and had the piano reconditioned for purely sentimental reasons. My mother had died a few months before, and I had been getting things in order for my father a little bit at a time. I put the jewelry in special silk pouches. The sweaters she had knitted in yellow, pink, bright orange, all the colors I hated. I put those in moth-proof boxes. I found some old Chinese silk dresses, the kind with little slits up the sides. I rubbed the old silk against my skin, then wrapped them in tissue and decided to take them home with me. After I had the piano tuned, I opened the lid and touched the keys. It sounded even richer than I remembered. Really, it was a very good piano. Inside the bench were the same exercise notes with handwritten scales, the same second-hand music books with their covers held together with yellow tape. I opened up the Schumann book to the dark little piece I had played at the recital. It was on the left-hand side of the page, Pleading Child. It looked more difficult than I remembered. I played a few bars, surprised at how easily the notes came back to me. And for the first time, or so it seemed, I noticed the piece on the right-hand side. It was called Perfectly Contented. I tried to play this one as well. It had a lighter melody, but the same flowing rhythm, and turned out to be quite easy. Pleading Child was shorter but slower. Perfectly Contented was longer but faster. And after I played them both a few times, I realized they were two halves of the same song. Okay, so that's the end of Joy Luck Club. 
what we're going to do now is you are going to go into Schoology and you are going to take a quiz over what you read. So let me show you where you're going to find that. Okay, so when you come into your ELA course, the first thing that you should see is the blue puzzle piece and it says two kinds from Joy Luck Club and it's the quiz. You'll also see it over here in your calendar. On some of the questions, they're gonna be in different orders, um, but on some of them that you will see a part A and a part B, and you will see a drop down. So this says which statement best sums up the theme or message of two kinds, and you're gonna drop it down to choose the right answer because then there's a part B. Okay, go ahead and take the rest of this time to finish up this quiz. 